Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope, uh, I mean, I know that uh, this conference has been so magnificent thus far, and uh, I get this time to speak to you just right after the lunch. So hopefully you'll find it interesting after the lunch, right? So great lunch. Um, my name is uh, Murali Kashabaina. Um, I'm uh, currently the co-founder, CEO of this com company called Entrigna. This is based in uh, Chicago. Um, here is a brief background on who I am, right? Um, I was at uh, United Airlines for almost 11 to 12 years back in the day when the merger happened with Continental. I was the CTO, chief architect for the merger for the systems integration aspect of it. And then later, I, you know, because of my interest in IoT and uh, big data and uh, AI and you know, prescriptive decisions and whatnot, I, we kind of started this off uh, as, a, as a company, Entrigna as a company, right? Uh, here is a little background on Entrigna, right? Entrigna is based in Chicago area. We are proud partners of uh, 1871, the incubator, the pr primary incubator located in Chicago. Um, our team, our core team, has a lot of experience in uh, large scale uh, uh, technology initiatives. As I said, we were kind of part of the United Airlines and led the entire systems integration for Continental and whatnot. Um, and then we have an advisory board, right? Eminent advisory board. I'll talk about that one. And we have bench strength that has some Erlang developers. Uh, we are still hunting for more Erlang developers. I'll talk about it. Um, since we are a kind of data science focused uh, company, we have uh, data scientists on, on our bench, right? And I'll talk more about it in, in a bit. So here are the celebrities that are on our advisory board. Uh, Rich Nemec, uh, if, if, you, if you are into Oracle world, is uh, the right hand of uh, Larry Ellison. Uh, he is uh, the first uh, AS director, first database administrator for Oracle. He was part of the founding uh, Oracle team. Uh, Robert Grossman is a very eminent uh, um, uh, uh, guy in the, in the research and development as far as healthcare is concerned. He is the chief informatics officer at uh, Uni University of Chicago. Uh, Tom Cook, he was uh, the one that was instrumental in founding uh, the Sabre Technologies based in, uh, uh, in Dallas, right? He is uh, from an airline background, and I know him because my airline background too. And Alan Orlick was the president of uh, NBC from media, right? So he is on our boat here. Um, so uh, you know, before I jump into what we did, I just want to give a quick uh, kind of demo of what our product is, right? It's better, a visual is better than what I speak about, right? So let me do a quick demo of it. By the way, I'm, I'm showing it on Windows, and uh, there is a story behind it, right? When we speak to our clients, um, even though we say that uh, we are Erlang based, and uh, um, even though we say that it's uh, operating system agnostic, right? The general people that we speak to are product leads, right? Product subject matter experts from a, our client's point of view. They're not necessarily technical. So when, when, we, when we say that uh, uh, our platform runs on all operating systems because of the Erlang virtual machine, the first question they will ask is, can you prove that it works on Windows, right? Um, we were de you know, doing the demos on Macs and all that, MacBook and all that. So until they saw that uh, it works on Windows, for some reason, for some perceptive hypothetical reason, uh, they didn't believe that it, wo it works on uh, all platforms, right? But then when we show it on Windows and say that this is Erlang, this works on all operating systems, no questions asked. Just to let you know, it's a, it's a perception base. That's why I'm demo uh, my demos are predominantly on Windows. That's why I'm using Windows uh, laptop today. So what you're seeing on the screen is uh, a Eclipse-based uh, um, um, graphical user interface. This is what we call as our products canvas. RTES is our product name, real-time export system. And uh, we, as I said, we focus more on data science aspect of it for in the context of IoT, and I'll talk about it a little bit. So th this is more like a tool for the, the data scientist right, that will work on our product. And this is, uh, you know, it's Eclipse. We extended Eclipse. Uh, there is a data science uh, Eclipse plugin called Nine, and we kind of leveraged that Nine within the Eclipse environment and and customized it uh, for our own purposes. What this does is it actually provides uh, a nice uh, kind of a uh, designer to uh, create the compute graph, right? This is the compute graph for a decision model, right? So, for example, real quick. I have this uh, data, right? It's a, it's a sensor data, so measured across uh, multiple sensors in a, in a typical IoT type of environment. 
there is a wind speed that is measured, uh, there is relative humidity that is measured, there is rain accumulation that is measured, rain duration and all that. These are attributes of the, the data measurements, uh, air temperature, air pressure and all that. So th this is a typical kind of data that comes in from different sensors. And probably the use case is to predict uh, whether, uh, a, a, whether the next day is going to be a humid day or a low humid day, right? Because in some IoT environment, humidity plays a critical role. And uh, there will be a need uh, to measure or predict uh, humidity so that precautions can be taken for whatever reason, right, in the, that particular business context. So in order to do a predictive model, right, someone has to take this data, create that compute graph to do a predictive model, right, like a machine learning predictive model. And that is what this tool is, right? And um, uh, here, you know, this is, this is all part of the graphical user interface, and these are all di different nodes that we provide as part of our repository of uh, nodes, right? I won't get into more details, but this more of a computer graph. Ultimately, um, you know, in this demo, I'm, a, I'm just building a very simple decision tree, which is part of the machine learning type of algorithm. And then I'm doing some bunch of uh, uh, validations and all that, and, and I'm, I'll, I'll show you in real quick. But before that, where is my product, right? I mean, where is the RTS product? So here it is. I'm on my local. I'm going to start my RTS uh, uh, node, actually, right? So here is, uh, I'm using, um, we are still using older version of it, of Erlang, but we are in the process of upgrading. So I'm going to give uh, Erlang its name, right? And this is my just uh, server node cookie, right? And uh, you know, this is where my server installation directory is for RTS, our product, and I'm going to start. So when I start, what you see on the left-hand side is Erlang shell, which is running the node, right? And this is the server log, right? I mean, this is Erlang shell, right? I mean, this is just like normal Erlang shell, right? But this is through my interface. I don't have to go to a command line and do that. Because I'm a data scientist, I don't want to know all the nitty-gritty details of starting the Erlang shell, right? So I start this, and then now I go here. So my server node is started, which is our data, the data science platform. And uh, I'm going to just uh, make sure that I'm pointing to the right node, right? I'm, I'm pointing to uh, localhost 9090, that is our server port. And uh, I'm going to just uh, run this model on that server node. Reset. So I'm running this data science model, right? Which is taking uh, uh, this data and creating a predictive model to predict future day is going to be a low humidity or high humidity uh, day, actually. And I'm not talking in terms of data science, but I'm just uh, giving a demo, demo of it, right? So now I'm, I run it. When I run it, it started building the decision tree. And you can see that uh, it's logging, right? The decision tree is being built. And um, once it is done, which, is, which is, it, it has completed in this case, um, I have some you know, accuracy measurements. And I'll show you what it built in real time, right? So here is uh, the decision tree based on all the attributes, right? So you can see it, if, the, if the given air pressure at 9 AM is greater than this value, whatever that value that my algorithm um, determined, evaluated, it will go into this branch of decisioning, right? Otherwise, it will go into this other branch of uh, decisioning, right? So, so th this, this is the predictive model. And there are a lot of other uh, machine learning uh, type of or, or optimization type of algorithms. This is a very simple uh, demo of what one algorithm can do. We have neural networks. We have uh, uh, time series analysis. We have uh, um, you know, uh, for ra random forest. We have many other types of optimization algorithms. I won't have to go get into that part of it. But uh, so th this, this should give you a picture of what our platform does. Our platform is uh, uh, a algorithmic data science platform. And uh, we, the core of it is actually built in Erlang. And uh, I'll, I'll talk what exactly we did in, as far as Erlang is concerned. And, and, and you, you can see that uh, once the decision model is built, it is getting deployed as a service, right? Uh, so there's no code written. It's uh, deployed as a service into the local host. And I can access that uh, using a JSON interface. So for example, uh, here I'm using Postman, which is uh, you know, HTTP type of uh, uh, interface to test uh, JSON services. Here I'm just sending uh, a data uh, for, to predict. This is my data vector to predict for, with all those uh, different attributes like 
temperature, you know, other wind speed and all that captured here. And when I do that, I'm pointing to my local host again, and I'm going to send this. What you get is uh, a, a predicted uh, uh, value, right? This is coming from the model that I just built that, that is getting deployed as a service in the, in the runtime container, and that, uh, that service is being accessed through this JSON interface, right? And uh, you can see it, it, it made that prediction. And um, uh, so th this is the core of it, right? Um, uh, this is a graphical user interface, and you have seen how we actually ended up uh, doing a lot of customization, right, to um, you know, build it um, in terms of integrating with uh, Erlang and how we did that in in integration and whatnot. So you will see that uh, shortly, what, what the technical details are. So given that background, right, um, so I want to just talk about uh, IoT as, 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 as it is, right? It's uh, IoT's uh, edge computing is where we are, our primary focus is. Um, this is a reference architecture that typically Entrigna uses to determine what kind of computations happen where. Um, so I won't get into all the details of it, but you can see that uh, there are things that, uh, that happen in the cloud environment, right, for operational intelligence, uh, for uh, uh, data warehouse type of uh, intelligence, right, data mining and, and things like that. And then there is the notion of edge network, which is uh, where all the sensors are getting deployed. There is a specific network uh, within which uh, this, this sensor data is being uh, integrated into the backend systems, right? Typically, there is something called a control domain, right? Which is kind of accumulated, the first receiver of the data into, into the entire computing environment, right? And then there is this edge gateway, which is acting more like a um, data aggregator, right? From multiple, um, uh, multiple control domains out there in the field, right? So, when we, when we say edge computing, what we are referring to is any processing that happens either in a control domain or edge gateway in terms of data processing and deriving insights out of it, that is what we are referring to as edge computing. Now, as the first receiver of the data from all these sensors, there is an opportunity to tap into that data and then derive intelligence right away, right, by applying a variety of uh, algorithms that I referred to earlier, right? Um, so when we do that, the, the action that is needed based on the decisions can be applied right away within that, within, within that context without having to make a round trip all the way into the backend cloud environment. There are cases wherein you want to do operational intelligence, as I said, which could happen in cloud environment for sure, where you are collecting tons of petabytes, terabytes of data, and you are applying more uh, compute intensive operations out there like data mining, data warehouse type of intelligence, which needs to be centralized in, in, in cloud environment for sure. But then when it comes to uh, edge computing, um, it's more about uh, applying the intelligence right there, wherever the data is getting generated, right, the first receiver concept. So this is uh, our reference architecture. So in the context of uh, how we are leveraging our platform for this IoT, um, how Erlang has helped us deal with this, this type of situation, I have a lot more information to cover, right? So I'll get into that details. So uh, what is the philosophy behind our, our concept of uh, edge computing, right? What we think is that uh, there is notion of predictive analytics. There are many companies that are dealing with predictive analytics, uh, but uh, we want to focus on the prescriptive decisions, which are real time. As soon as data is generated, you may want to tap into that data real quick and make a decision and, and help uh, the decision be applied in a business context somewhere, right? That's the kind of, that, that's where the differentiating philosophy is. Um, you know, and, and, then, and then make sure that uh, whatever intelligence we derive at the edge is actionable, right? So that you can take some action, right? That, that, that happens a lot in the IoT context of it. So that's where our philosophy is. When it comes to edge, you be real time, you act upon the data as soon as you receive the data for first time, and then make a decision so that business action can be taken. Right? That's kind of a, a context we, we apply as a philosophy. So uh, what is our conceptual architecture look like? Right? So th this is uh, the main, main thing is the central is, the, is our platform, the, the one I ran and uh, shown as an example. And uh, we have integration points. Right? Um, messaging, asynchronous messaging is uh, a critical aspect of it. So I was in another, another uh, session earlier. We talked there, there was a lot of talk about uh, MQTT protocol, co-op, 
type of protocol and how the data get fed into a centralized system and whatnot for, from an IoT, cellular IoT point of view. Um, similar paradigm here, right? We need to ingest data into our system so that we can apply some uh, intelligence on it and make, take an action right away, right? So we, we kind of, by default, we choose to go with RabbitMQ, but we are open, uh, our interfaces are open to interact with uh, any other middleware technology for that matter, like Kafka or MQTT brokers, um, various other uh, messaging uh, platforms with uh, specific standard-based uh, uh, interfacing and uh, co communication protocols. So we, we do support a lot of that. And then on the back end, uh, we went with React to begin with, right? Because um, it was easy to in integrate. Of, of course, React had its own uh, advantages at that point in terms of uh, key value storage. We wanted to take advantage of it, of course. And then uh, using the proto buffers, it was easy to integrate directly at the Erlang level right, Erlang to Erlang communication, kind of, using the proto buffers. It was relatively easy for us uh, to integrate into React back, backend store, right? So that, that was our primary goal, in order to minimize the latencies back and forth in terms of da data exchange from our platform. So React was our kind of de facto at that point, but then based on our client needs, there was a need to integrate with HBase, right? There was a need to integrate with uh, Redis. There was a need to integrate with Cassandra, right? So we had to deal with uh, those specific situations, and uh, because the drivers were not mature enough in case of Erlang when it comes to dealing with uh, Cassandra and other uh, technologies, we had to do a lot of uh, port binding, right? And then NIFS and all that, which I'm gonna talk about again. Uh, here is a simple use case. Um, won't get into more details of it, but you know, it's a IoT type of uh, situation. Uh, healthcare is one primary focus. Um, patient wearables are emerging, uh, like mushrooms, um, there's a lot of data flowing in, and there is a lot of opportunity to tap into that intelligence to um, make sure care is enhanced, right, patient care. So this is a good example wherein we are actually working with a potential client, and uh, we are about to uh, kind of deploy a similar use case using our product very soon. Um, so, so what is our underlying uh, you know, platform architecture, right? We have, we have distributed computing everywhere in our platform. So what we did, first thing we did is that uh, we, of course, we wanted to follow OTP at the core of it uh, with all the supervision trees. Like you, you can see that uh, you know, we have a very broad uh, taxonomy or the hierarchy of supervision happening. And uh, you, can, you can see that uh, we are more of a ring architecture cluster without a master, right, masterless perhaps. Uh, we want to make it as much as possible masterless. But uh, one challenge we faced was that uh, because ours is somewhat data intensive, right? Compute and data intensive. When we relied on de, uh, de facto or default Erlang node-to-node -node communication, right? Uh, there was some kind of issue in terms of uh, maintaining the, the health of uh, Erlang node. So in a cluster mode, um, when nodes were kind of known to each other, right? They, 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 know, they know each other and there is the, the Erlang node-to-node -node communication enabled. Um, when there was a lot of intense computations were going on, for some reason, some nodes were marked as shut down. Because the, we, even though we try to play with uh, the tick time uh, that is there to manage the, the health of it, uh, but still somehow the uh, somehow we could not really enhance the, that, that aspect of it, or we could not fix it uh, in, a, in a solid way. So in order to minimize that impact, what we did is that uh, we had to come up with our own uh, node-to-node node, uh, communication mechanism, which, which is what we are calling as RTS net. It is a communication mechanism. It has ability to create pools of connections um, across the different nodes in the cluster, Erlang nodes, and then um, we have handlers, handlers to handle the request, the, the chattiness that happens between the nodes in terms of uh, supporting a data science model or whatever, right, the computations. So we, we had to create that layer, and uh, you know, we had to use the default Erlang's node-to-node -node only for the purposes of heartbeat and uh, health checkups, so that we free up the application logic data communication from the underlying, uh, you know, uh, the, the default communication that happens, node to node, right? Um, so you can see that um, 
you know, we have this, uh, you know, artistnet, uh, you know, some, some source code is being, snippets of source code is being shown here. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, we, we have that API, for lack of a better word, artistnet client socket handler, right, right there highlighted. Um, you know, you can see that uh, we, we are sending all our communication through that channel instead of using uh, uh, the default, uh, you know, the process message passing, right? So behind the scenes, it will do message passing, but it is local message passing. Across the nodes, you know, that, that, that layer will take care of passing the messages back and forth within the nodes of the uh, cluster. And, uh, and, and you can see that, uh, you, know, we, you know, we typically OTP standard-based. Everything is OP, OTP process. Uh, gen server to, uh, predominantly, right? And uh, we, we made sure that, uh, you know, we, we create uh, the gen server along with the supervision aspect of it so that we, we know the, we address the fault tolerance of it, right? So again, this is a lot of information, but I uh, wanted to summarize it in one slide. These code snippets are taken specifically to showcase uh, the important pieces of it. For example, we are using the Erlang monitor, right? Node monitoring, which is, which will use the default communication to check the status of the node, right? Um, but, but, but then that is limited to that part. Only for those health checks, we will rely on the default mechanism. But then for application side of communication, you can see that we are using RTSnet. Um, and then, um, you know, we, we do a lot of uh, data, right? We, we deal with uh, large data matrices and whatnot. So what we did is that uh, we took advantage of uh, uh, the process message passing, right? Message passing paradigm and process concurrency aspect of it to to simulate or emulate map reduce type of computations, right? So essentially, what we did is that uh, we partition a big matrix, linear algebra type of matrix, into parts, and then we distribute those parts across the nodes. So if there is one matrix, matrix A, it has part A1 in node one, like uh, like shown on the picture. Uh, A2 in node 2, A3 in node 3 perhaps, A4 in node 4, right? Likewise, there is a matrix B whose part B1 is, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in node 4 because, it's, it's, as I said, there's no master, uh, masterless architecture, right? So you can see that uh, the parts of each matrix are distributed. And then when an operation happens, like when, when we are doing a matrix multiplication operation, right? A star B, we, we are supposed to create a new matrix and that operation is kind of done in a map reduce format. The, we, we spread that computation to the respective uh, nodes, like those green blocks over there are like the, the mappers, right? They're, they're running in each node, wherever the data is, the matrix part is, and it is doing the actual operation and then consolidating that into the resulting matrix called C, right? So you can see all, all that code being handled uh, through the process uh, uh, message passing and uh, process concurrency. I won't get into all those details, but this picture should give an idea of uh, how we kind of distributed uh, you know, the, the, the data more efficiently, very easily using Erlang. This would not have been possible. If I had to write this in Java or any other language, I will have to probably write tons of code to begin with, and then I have to do a lot of regression to make sure that uh, it meets all the scenarios of computation, right? But with uh, Erlang, it made, uh, the code was um, easy to develop, and uh, because of the message passing paradigm, it was easy to maintain that uh, asynchronous messaging, perhaps, um, you know, in, in, a, in a more uh, reliable fashion, right? So this is one aspect of it. This was a key uh, deter, deter, uh, kind of an enabler for us in terms of uh, leveraging Erlang's capability, right? The other one is, uh, you know, integration with, uh, you know, GPUs, right? So because we all know that data crunching is not a core competency of Erlang for that matter, so we had to delegate the data computation to other external libraries, right? So for example, if we have to take advantage of GPU, how can we delegate the data crunching to a GPU-based uh, crunching, right, mathematical uh, crunching? So we relied on OpenCL. So the code here on the left-hand side is, um, um, on the right-hand side of, uh, my right-hand side is the OpenCL code, and then on the left-hand side is, uh, you know, the actual Erlang code that integrates into leveraging that GPU, right? Courtesy, we used uh, Tony Rogwell's uh, open source library. It's a NIF-based library to integrate with OpenCL. Um, that was a pretty, pretty cool library for us. Um, and then what we did is that, uh, 
all the matrix operations in the previous slide that you saw, actually those individual matrix operations on each node are, are actually getting uh, offloaded to OpenCL on GPU. That way the data crunching happens real fast, right? I mean, it's uh, microseconds for that matter, right? So this is the type of, uh, so the distribution is through whatever I talked about earlier, the matrix partitions. And then within each partition, when, when mapper, when, when uh, computations happen, that computations are delegated down to the GPU level through OpenCL and using this integration layer, right? So that, that's one key advantage that we saw. If I have to do this again in other language, tons of code, right, tons of code. Uh, but it was seamless in, uh, in, uh, in, in Erlang. And of course, the courtesy goes to, um, credits goes to Tony's, uh, Tony's library at that point. The, and of course, uh, we cannot get away from uh, other languages because, as I said, there are drivers that are very efficient for integrating with HBase, Cassandra, Redis, and all that. And, and, and there are some C libraries that are meant for computation purposes, and there are Python libraries too, right? So we totally cannot get away from other languages for that, for that matter. There will be some dependency on other languages. And the way we took advantage of it is through, uh, for example, in case of Java, we took advantage by using uh, port binding and uh, J interface, right? So we, had, uh, we created a framework um, of our own so that uh, we can introduce uh, you know, different, different Java uh, components if on, on a demand basis, on a request basis. So we have that framework. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see that uh, little diagram there, um, you know, which is using that port binding concept, but then uh, it, it is flexible enough to um, inject uh, different handlers. So for example, on, the, on this side, you know, start Java port, that, co that code is Erlang code, which is starting the port with uh, pointing to the JVM, right? You can see that line there, right? I mean, if I can use my mouse, that would be easier. So this is the, you know, this is the J JVM node, uh, which is J interface based. And uh, this is my Erlang node. And this is my port. The, the Pentagon is like a port. And that port is managing uh, the, the, J the Java node, right? And these little handlers that you see here, they are the Erlang uh, Erlang, Erlang counterparts to the little processes that run within the Java node, right? So this could be a HBase handler, right? This could be a Redis handler or Cassandra handler. Corresponding to these handlers, we have these processes that are point that are managing uh, that that particular uh, external process, and we we inter interact. Our code interacts with uh, these processes in a in a uh, agnostic manner. Actually, I mean it could be uh, Java, it could be Python, but uh, um, all that happens in the Erlang is through Erlang interfaces, Erlang modules and Erlang functions, right? So, the, so the, what, what happens is that uh, if there is a need for us to introduce new Java library, what we do is that uh, we typically create a handler like this. Like in this particular case, this code is showing HBase handler, and we spin off that process in that particular JVM instance, right? Like here. I'm just starting Java handler, which is, in this particular case, an HBase instance, right? I can create similar handlers, put it into the jar class path, make it available, and then spin those uh, uh, handlers in the corresponding uh, Java node anytime, right? That, that's one, one beauty that we get out of this Erlang uh, integration with other, other languages, right? And you can see on the, on the right hand, uh, here you can see the actual Java code, which is, uh, you know, complying with uh, our framework interface, uh, and then that, that is the entry point to handle a particular request coming from the Erlang side of it, right? So the, this is a, 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 a key feature that we found very useful as far as port support and uh, J interface, uh, you know, and Python type of uh, integration is concerned, right? In other languages, it would be a little tricky. I, we have experimented with Java before, and, and we try to invoke uh, Python through Java. It was a little messy at that point. But, and, then, and then it's error prone and somewhat unreliable, right? Unreliable in the sense we don't know when, uh, if there is an exception or error happening, how to catch that exception and make a meaningful handling of that exception, right? So all that actually. It, it was seamless in Erlang for that matter. And the code is evidence here. The other thing is that uh, as part of our uh, uh, core um, algorithms that we provide, we have a business rules engine, right? So, how do we actually create business rules, right? Our requirement was to create business rules in plain English, 
right? Like you, like you see here, uh, this is plain, almost plain English. These are called production rules, right? In the industry standard, you actually write uh, plain English, uh, and you want to run it as Erlang code, right? How is this possible? I mean, how can we do this? So again, Erlang came to uh, rescue here very easily. We relied on um, uh, Erlang's uh, yet another compilers compiler, YECC, and uh, the Lexer, Lexer generator. And uh, what we did is that uh, uh, we, we created that uh, grammar, the back, back, backness nor BNF grammar, to take advantage of uh, YECC and uh, Lex, right? And, and, and we, cre we created uh, you know, this neat uh, uh, gram uh, DSL, domain-specific language, for defining our rules, right? And how to transform a English language into Erlang code, right? In a more reliable fashion, right? That point, we took advantage of uh, abstract syntax form, right? What we, whatever uh, Lexer and Parser does is it will convert this English language token, perhaps, into this uh, abstract form, abstract syntactical form, and then that is compiled into Erlang code, and that is what gets loaded as a rule. Very simple, right? There is a rule here, very simple brother relationship rule, and you can see how it is getting converted into the corresponding Erlang function, right? Which is which will be executed as a rule, right? So the, this was yet another very uh, very useful thing from as far as uh, what we wanted to develop, uh, and then this Erlang came to our rescue again, right? Um, and of course, you have seen this interface. Uh, we used, uh, um, I don't know if many people know, but there is something called a Rex, Remote uh, Execution Server. We took advantage of it to create a remote shell. Like for example, you, know, you have seen this before. I started it in the demo. Uh, within the Eclipse, we have an Erlang shell, but then actually Erlang shell is running on the, on the operating system, right? It's not running within the Eclipse. So uh, from the, this, interface into the Erlang, actual Erlang shell, we leverage something called uh, Remote Execution Server, Rex, which is a process that runs in the Erlang instance, and we communicate uh, to, to simulate a shell environment, right? That's what we are using behind the scenes for, for all these uh, uh, you know, Erlang shells, right? And then we also wanted to follow the, um, the testing, unit testing approach when we develop all this code. So we relied on uh, common test. And, and in order to execute uh, those common tests seamlessly, we actually uh, provided uh, this little uh, Eclipse plugin, right? The, the, the one that you see here. So it's a, it's a graphical user interface. We run those unit tests, which are common tests, common test-based suites, and uh, it, it populates the test coverage and all that seamlessly. There is no real coding and all that, actually, because we want to minimize the time uh, any data scientist would potentially spend in creating uh, any Erlang components at that point, or any customization of it. So you can see that um, we, we took advantage of Rex at the, at, the, at the core of it, the remote execution server, that, that by default runs in a uh, actual Erlang runtime, and we, we remotely in integrate into that Rex in terms of uh, doing all this uh, uh, application graphical user, user interface uh, operations, like running test cases, uh, you know, starting a server instance, uh, you know, doing all kinds of things that we want to do actually, right? So this is yet another powerful feature uh, that offered a capability for us to seamlessly integrate uh, uh, using uh, Eclipse plugins and whatnot. So they, this is something that we took advantage of, right? Um, so ultimately what we did, right, we actually ended up building this enterprise, enterprise class IoT platform, right, the one that I was demoing earlier. Um, it has so many different um, features, um, you know, using GPU technology and uh, other C libraries and whatnot, we were able to take advantage of uh, some of the mathematical foundational algorithms. Uh, we built a core decision-making engine, and uh, you know, the, this is this is exactly what we did in terms of uh, developing uh, the core platform, taking fullest advantage of Erlang capabilities, and building all these neat uh, tools and then the capabilities in terms of integrating with the data sources, ingesting data and whatnot, right? So ultimately the goal is uh, to enable uh, real-time decisioning, the prescriptive decisions that I talked about earlier, uh, in a very seamless fashion with, uh, with the tool set being provided on top of the core platform, which is a very reliable platform because of all the good things that I talked about. Um, very specifically, we took a lot of advantage of uh, inbuilt uh, capabilities, right? Um, dynamic pattern matching, right? 
it, it's a mandatory, beautiful thing to happen, right? And then binary comprehensions. People don't know, but uh, that's a beautiful thing too, because we, when we exchange data, if you tap into that data at the, at, the, at the bytes level, and if you want to do operations to minimize the, uh, the, the, the latencies, binary comprehensions were extremely fast as far as we are concerned. Right? They, they, came, they came to our rescue uh, for many occasions, actually. And uh, uh, some of the data structures, right, GB trees, um, uh, you know, general balanced uh, sets, right, general balanced uh, trees, right, uh, digraphs, right, these came very handy because we had to represent data in these formats for specific uh, algorithmic processing, and uh, it was very easy to leverage these inbuilt uh, uh, data structures without having to develop something from ground up, right? It was very easy and uh, very seamless at that point. And uh, we did take advantage of ETS, uh, Erlang Term Storage, um, because there was some need uh, in terms of our uh, data processing. We tried to do Amnesia before, uh, for whatever reason, in our trusted environment, um, as far as scalability was concerned, there was some concerns expressed. So when we designed our runtime, we actually partitioned in a way that uh, we can leverage uh, simple ETS uh, storages at that point with the uh, default settings. Um, it's not like we were creating custom ordinal uh, ordered uh, you know, ETS and all that. It's a very simple by default ETS that was sufficient for our caching needs and uh, efficient from a uh, query request, query time point of view. Um, and, and, and you know there are so many other nitty-gritty Erlang features that we used. I probably won't have time to cover all of them. I would be very happy to uh, talk about it in, in some other context for sure. But uh, I just wanted to give you a picture of what we did uh, in terms of what our product does and how we leverage uh, Erlang uh, to the maximum, right? So what what is Entrigna all about, right? So Entrigna, as I said, is focusing on IoT. And these are the verticals that uh, Entrigna is primarily focusing on in terms of the marketplace. Um, solutions in manufacturing. Somebody talked about industrial IoT, right? We, we are trying to be a player in that industrial IoT as far as manufacturing is concerned. Same thing with uh, transportation and logistics, right? There's a lot of opportunity to tap into the IoT data that, that flows through the networks of uh, transportation and logistics, right? So that's some, something that we are looking at. Smart cities, right? Smart cities are happening everywhere. San Francisco, Kansas City, Chicago, all these are becoming more like a smart city hubs, actually. Um, so there's, there's a lot of data, again, and there's a lot of opportunity to apply some intelligence right there, right, in the context of edge computing that I talked about. Solutions in healthcare, tons of opportunity in healthcare. Um, healthcare is all driven by biomedical devices. Um, there's a lot of uh, biomedical devices now being uh, enabled to be in the internet unlike the traditional biomedical devices. There's a lot of data that flows through the networks of healthcare. Again, there is a, a great opportunity to tap into that data, right? And then solutions in non-traditional industries. We call non-traditional industries because there's no category they fall into, right? So for example, we are here, and there must be a big boiler which is boiling the water to supply into each room right here for a hot water. So there are manufacturers of that boiler and they want to tap into boiler being in the, in the internet so that they can monitor the health of that boiler and do some interesting uh, you know, activities around it, right? So uh, that, that falls into a non-traditional uh, business or non-traditional non industry for that matter. So we, we are playing in all these roles and more recently because we wanted to prove out the notion of edge computing, um, what we did is that we created a cluster of Raspberry Pis, right? Uh, these micro microprocessors, we ran our Erlang platform on this Raspberry Pis, uh, a cluster of nine nodes, and we ran a kind of a AI algorithm on, on top of it, right? So uh, that was a beautiful thing, beautiful use case that we presented at a major IoT conference more recently, and uh, there was a lot of attention that we gained out of it. Um, I could have demoed that. Raspberry Pi cluster today, but because of the time, I could not. But I would be very happy to showcase that at, at the next opportunity. Um, we have that. We always uh, take it along with us. The cluster is movable, portable, so easy to integrate and uh, give a demo for sure. But uh, uh, there was no, no change, right? Uh, Erlang virtual machine was successfully run on Raspbian operating system without any um, customization or any uh, fine-tuning or any, anything of that nature. We actually compiled 
Erlang so from source code on Raspbian operating system without any hiccup. It was just like at another Linux environment, and we were able to simply compile the Erlang uh, you know, runtime from the source code itself. Right? Um, so that should conclude my conversation today. I, I hope you found it uh, interesting, but uh, my general remark is, has been that uh, our decision to go with Erlang ab about seven years back paid rich dividends for us as far as the goal and objectives of our product. Uh, because of the architectural concerns that we were able to successfully address and build a tool set, um, you know, leveraging all this. Right? So thank you. I appreciate your time today. If you need to contact me, uh, you have my information. You can contact uh, you know, Entrigna you know, at these locations. Uh, we have a Twitter account. We, have, uh, we are on social media, LinkedIn, and all that. Of course, you can reach out to info at entrigna.com for more information. And I can do a more customized uh, demos and uh, product demos and whatnot at a later time. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. So uh, you're, you were running locally on your laptop. Is your general deployment like an on-premise on server farm, and then people on their desktop would talk to you would yes. connect to yes. the local network? Yes. So do you, do you provide a platform as a service, like a kind of a cloud-based one as well? We, we are, uh, our clients have been predominantly on AWS. So uh, <laughs> we have been working with our AWS support. We are a partner of AWS. And uh, we have created um, VMs, uh, you know, uh, you know, VMs out there on AWS and provided that co connectivity to our clients. Right? We also have a couple of instances running in Azure. Right? Um, so that is, that is also happening. But uh, to your point, whether we are going to provide it as a cloud service, we are in talks with AWS. We need to go through a certification process for that one. And once that is uh, once that is successful. Our service will be provided through AWS as a certified, uh, you know, platform. We are in, in that process right now because of our success story uh, so far with uh, multiple clients being on AWS. AWS itself felt that uh, maybe we should get into the certification process. Are majority of your clients writing their own OpenCL or uses that? I mean, I'm that's a big part of what you provide, right? They they are not writing the uh, OpenCL. What they're doing is. Yes, 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 their, their sure. So he, what, they're, what they're developing is this flows, right? Um, and then you, you see here, deployment RAR creator. RAR creator is uh, RTS archive, right? Ah. So you can see when I ran this, it probably created a RAR file on my local. Uh, let me see. Yeah, right here. It's a RAR file, right? Um, I'll just open it. So it has some configuration information, right? Some artist config. You can see this is all Erlang term, right? So no one touches Erlang at that point. It's made seamless. Unless there is a real need for customization, wherein our R&D department has to get engaged, our client folks, they don't deal with Erlang. They deal with uh, Yes. They, they will build their own RAR file and deploy it into the uh, runtime environment. Just, uh, just to show you, right here is um, my server installation directory here, right on my local. Same thing happens on Linux or wherever. And uh, RAR files will go here under the applications folder, right? They their own farm. And they just deploy the RAR file into the application folder and it will run the required modules and expose the service to, right? All the services. Now, the servi once the service is deployed, it can be accessed through RabbitMQ, it can be accessed through Kafka, it can be accessed through general HTTP that I showed you earlier, and it can also be accessed through WebSocket. So we enabled, we took advantage of some WebSocket capability in Erlang, and we exposed the same service as a WebSocket service so that web apps can interact with the service uh, seamlessly. Right, so that we did. Uh, but but uh, to answer your question, yes, client folks will develop these flows. And we, we provide all the necessary uh, requirements uh, through this repository of nodes, right? They can just uh, drag and drop, right, like this, and, and, and connect it into the workflow, right? Whatever they are. Yes. That, right. I mean, that, that yes. Ultimate, ultimately, the result of this flow, data flow, compute graph is a RAR file. Like you can see, ultimately, that is, they are creating a RAR file, right? 
and that, that RAR file is the deployment, that go artifact that gets deployed in our server runtime. And server runtime is smart enough to load required uh, modules. Right? So. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>